Good afternoon. My name is Bishop Sherman Randall Pius Mosley. I am the Superior General of the Society of St. Alphonsus Marie de la Guari, and we welcome you to our noonday broadcast of meditations. We hope and pray that these meditations will inspire you and strengthen you in your faith and your journey with the Lord. We also welcome you to our mother house of the Society of St. Alphonsus Marie de la Guari, where we are recording this. We also ask that you pray for our parish, the Saints Peter and Paul Traditional Catholic Latin Mass Church. Today I want to talk about elements of true obedience. Elements of true obedience. Just do it. Elements of true obedience. What does God expect of me? Certainly, we would affirm that God expects us to obey him. If he is Lord, then we are expected to obey his commands. I came across some interesting words written by many great fathers of the church. Listen to what St. Augustine writes. Make no reserve, exercise no choice, but obey his command. When you know what he commands, do not hesitate. St. Benedict of Nursia says, do not question or try to avoid it, but do it. Do it at once. Do it heartily. Do it cheerfully. Do it to the full. It is but a little thing that as our Lord has uh, bought us with the price of his own blood, we should be his servants. Obedience is but a little thing considering who he is and who we are. So just do it. The obedience that God demands involves more than just meeting a set of exact requirements. God has always designed our uh, outward obedience to be a reflection of a person's inner submission to God himself. Jesus our Lord challenges his disciples by telling them that their righteousness, doing of the right things, had to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and of the Pharisees. What are the elements of true obedience? The first point that I like to point out today is do it all. Comprehensiveness. Does God require you to keep all his commandments? That's the question. There may not be an easier question to answer from the scriptures. God has always measured obedience by the full extent of his word. After the crossing of the Red Sea, the Israelites come to march and they came to this place that God wanted them to come to. So at the crossing of the Red Sea, they, they came to Merah and they began to complain as so many of us do when God delivers us. God delivered the Israelites from uh, slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, from that bondage. And so after Moses obeyed God and brought the children of Israel out of this strange idolatrous place, at the crossing of the Red Sea, the Israelites come to Merah and they begin to complain because the waters is unusable. God miraculously cleanses the water and offers these words as we find in the Old Testament book of Exodus, the second book of the Pentateuch, Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. And the word says, if 
you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight. Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Think about our moment now, this period in which the whole world is going through, this time of crises. Why is this happening to us? I am not a doomsday sayer, nor am I trying to prophesy anything. We know that our Lord God is coming soon. We do not know the day nor the hour that the Lord will come, but he's coming back for his church without spot or wrinkle or any such blemish. So we believe, because in the Nicene Creed, we profess each Sunday that he shall come again in glory to judge both the quick and the dead. So we believe in the second return of the Lord. We do not know the day nor the hour. And yet in this time, we see the plague is all over the world. Now, there are many that says this is not a plague, but yes, it is because God is angry. And the Bible says in Romans 1 that the wrath of God is on the children of disobedience. St. Paul writes very clearly in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 31. When you have the time, read it. Also, in Colossians chapter 3, St. Paul writes that if you then be risen in Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And then he says, put off that old man and put on Christ and be renewed. Many of us have not been obedient to the Lord. We have constantly complained about the blessings that God has done for us. We have not really looked clearly at all that God has proven and has done for us for so long, even in our own personal lives. We look at the world, many ungrateful people, there's so much disobedience, so much lawlessness, so much immorality in the land. And yet, we expect God to be happy. Abortions, euthanasia, same-sex marriage, homosexuality, not only in the laity, but also in the church, among clergy. And why is it? Because man's disobedience. The wrath of God is on the children of disobedience. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, I want to read again for you. The Lord God says to Moses as he writes, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. When you have the opportunity, read Deuteronomy chapter 28. The Lord says, if you observe and do all that I've commanded you, I'll bless you. And then it drops down in that same chapter. But if you refuse to do what I've commanded you, I will send these curses upon you. Our Lady of Fatima appeared to the three children in Fatima, Portugal in 1917. And when she appeared, her message was the same as the scripture. Mankind has offended God. Give them a message. Tell them, do not offend the Lord God anymore, for he is greatly offended. The church has offended the Lord. So many terrible things have happened in the Roman Catholic Church. And why? Because man has turned their hearts away from God. The modernist church is doing completely opposite of what God commands. Modernism has entered into the church so much. False ecumenism, false interreligious dialogue, false Christian liberty, and why? Because man love evil and does evil 
more than good. Now, after the giving of the law concerning the Sabbath, an Israelite was caught gathering sticks on the Sabbath, a clear violation of the law of Moses. They appealed to Moses as to the response, and Moses commanded that he be put to death. Then God spoke to Moses with some further instructions as we find in Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 through 40, and I'll read. And again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, in verse 38, speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And in verse 39 of Numbers 15, it says, And you shall have the tassel, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined. And in verse 40, And that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. The next point is, is that Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. In St. James, in the New Testament, St. James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. So if our Lord Jesus Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments, James gives us the true parameters of obedience. You and I must be obedient. Before we close today, I just want to read 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 7 through 13. It says about David's disobedience. It speaks about his disobedience and the repercussions of his disobedience. What happens when we are disobedient? But David's heart struck him, 1 Chronicles 21, verses 7 through 13 in the Dewey Reigns Bible. But David's heart struck him after the people were numbered. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned very much in what I have done. But I pray thee, O Lord, to take away the iniquity of thy servant, because I have done exceedingly foolishly. And David arose in the morning, and the word of the Lord came to Gad, the prophet, and the seer of David, saying, Go and say to David, Thus saith the Lord, I will give thee thy choice of three things. Choose one of them which thou wilt, that I may do it to thee. And when Gad was come to David, he told him, saying, Either seven years of famine shall come to thee in thy land, or thou shalt flee three months before thy adversaries, and they shall pursue thee, or for three days there shall be a pestilence in the land. Now therefore, deliberate, and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. In verse 14 of First Chronicles chapter 21. And David said to God, I am in a great strait, but it is better that I should fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are many, than into the hands of men. And then because of man's disobedience, we see the result of First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 15. And the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning unto the time appointed, and there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men. In verse 16 of First Chronicles chapter 21. And when the angel of the Lord had stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord had pity on the affliction and said to the angel that slew the people, It is enough. Now hold thy hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Ayurana, the Jezebusite. And in verse 17, And David said to the Lord, 
when he saw the angel striking the people, it is I, I am he that have sinned. I have done wickedly. These that are the sheep, what have they done? Left thy hand, I beseech thee, be turned against me and against my father's house. What is God saying? What is he saying in this time? Because of our disobedience, God has unleashed upon the land this pestilence. And until mankind returns back to God, then 2 Chronicles 7th chapter, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven. And then I will hear their prayer and heal the land. God is still asking man to return back to him. And yet when we look here, when we look out among us, so many people are still turning their backs on God. Until tomorrow, as we come back together again, elements of true obedience, just do it. And we will cover tomorrow our second point. May the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Let us pray. Oh Jesus, you would not have one that loves you well take any other road than that which you yourself took. And now I have decided to follow you, to walk in your footsteps on the path of holy obedience. A way hallowed out in the solid rock of your example, of your most humble submission, of your inevitable subjection. O oh God, you who reign over the angels, you whom the principalities and powers obey, were subject to Mary and to Joseph according to the scriptures, and not only principalities, but you were subject to Mary and not only to Mary, but also to Joseph because of Mary. For God to obey a creature, for the second person to obey a creature in this world, Mary and Joseph, creatures created in your image. Mary, immaculate from the first moment of her conception. Joseph born in sin, but was made just by God's grace. For God to obey a creature is humility without a parallel. O oh Lord, you abase yourself and I shall, I exalt myself. O oh my soul, if you disdain to imitate the example of a man, it will certainly not be unworthy of you to imitate your creator. Lord Jesus, help us to be obedient. For obedience should not be a burden. It should be a grace. We thank you, Lord Jesus, through Mary, our mother, in Jesus' name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless you and keep you.